In a previous video, I opened a discussion on the activity series of metals with this demonstration of the classic reaction between copper chloride and aluminum. In that video, I used a 0.1 molar solution of copper chloride, and a few things about that reaction bothered me. I've done this reaction hundreds of times before, but this one was just boring. So let's try and make it a little bit more exciting without it going out of control. First, let's quickly review the activity series. If a sample of a more reactive metal is placed into a solution containing ions of a less reactive metal, the series predicts that the more reactive element will lose its electrons and the less reactive element in solution will grab the electrons and precipitate out as solid metal. For example, placing a piece of zinc metal into a solution containing tin ions will cause the zinc to dissolve into solution and crystals of tin metal to form. Because aluminum is a fairly reactive metal, under these particular reaction conditions it also reacts with water. We'll talk about what these conditions means in a little while. In typical house lab fashion, the picture's out of focus, I mean, there's an ulterior motive to doing this experiment that involves removing some excess chemical inventory. In this experiment, I'll be using up these two premixed solutions and a good amount of the dry chemical to make up new solutions, which will not be mixed in excess and stored. I'm also going to use some scraps of aluminum foil that have been accumulating for a while. Here we have an attractive array of copper chloride solutions. From the right, we have the same 0.1 molar solution that I suspect provided the lackluster performance last time. Then we have a 0.25 molar solution, a 0.5 molar, 0.75 molar, and finally one molar. To each of these solutions, I'm going to add roughly a gram to a gram and a quarter of aluminum foil. I'm looking for an obvious and quick to start reaction. The brown precipitate of copper metal will start to appear on the aluminum, hydrogen gas will be generated, the temperature will increase, and an unpleasant smell will fill the immediate vicinity. Not my favorite part, but whatever. I'm looking for a reaction that's not too slow, but not too fast. As I work my way through the different concentrations, we'll have a little story time. This reaction holds a special place in my heart because it's one of the first ones I ever did in my home lab a long, long, long time ago. Back then, I wasn't too interested in making proper solutions, so I just dumped some of the dry chemical into water arbitrarily. Sometimes it was a good reaction, and sometimes it was a bit out of control. Now, in this experiment, I'll finally find out where those lines are drawn. Let's recap so far. The 0.1 molar solution took quite a while to get going and never really got exciting at all. The 0.25 molar solution was proportionally faster to start and it went along at a respectable but slow pace, still a bit on the boring side. At 0.5 molar, the reaction started right away and before the 0.1 and 0.25 molar solutions were really going, it showed vigorous gas generation and chunks of copper were falling to the bottom of the beaker. The start of the reaction at 0.75 molar was comparable to 0.5 molar, but it was more intense and rapidly overtook the 0.5 molar solution. The 1 molar reaction started almost instantly and quickly began emitting steam. When the contents of the beakers were stirred, the one molar test almost overflowed the beaker. For my money, I like the one right in the middle the best, 0.5 molar. Feel free to leave a comment and say which one was your favorite. I ended up adding a little more aluminum to the 0.75 and one molar solutions, and then I let everything sit overnight. The 0.1 and 0.25 molar solutions needed that long to lose the copper blue color in solution with an obvious excess of aluminum. Off camera, I measured the temperature of each reaction and in the 0.1 molar solution, it was a mere three degrees above room temperature. 
but in the one molar solution, it was an amazing 65 degrees above room temperature. That's almost 90 degrees Celsius. Overall, my favorite is still the 0.5 molar. It's sort of the Goldilocks one right in the middle, and it was a nice reaction, and even the product looks nice. As with most models in chemistry, the predictability of the activity series has exceptions. Lots of them. Earlier, I said that aluminum reacts with water under these conditions. Let's explore that now. Both aluminum and magnesium are highly reactive, but don't usually react with water. This is because they readily form a sort of skin of their oxides. Aluminum and magnesium oxides are very stable and protect the underlying metal from reacting spontaneously with its surroundings. In this particular experiment, the chloride ions in solution compromise the oxide layer and allows the reaction with copper and subsequently water to happen. Here I have three beakers, each with a 0.5 molar solution of copper sulfate. The activity series says there should be a reaction because aluminum is more reactive than copper. However, as you can see, there's absolutely no reaction. Five minutes later, and there's still a whole lot of nothing going on. With copper chloride, the reaction was pretty much done in five minutes. So what's the difference here? This is a classic experiment, but if, and that's a big if, a lab manual mentions it at all, it simply says chloride ions must be present for the reaction to occur. I can't just leave it at that. I can't go too deep down the rabbit hole of experimentation right now, but let me demonstrate what happens when the copper sulfate experiment is enhanced with chloride ions. Hiding behind beaker number one is 10 milliliters of 6 molar hydrochloric acid. That will be our source of chloride ions. Upon addition, a very slight greenish color is noted, and that's a copper and chloride complex. Within a few seconds, the reaction proceeds as it did before. This makes the chloride appear to act as a catalyst. But I can hear you. What if it's the acid that's causing the aluminum to react? I hear you, and I had the same question. So hiding behind beaker number two is 10 milliliters of a 3 molar sulfuric acid solution. This is the same acid concentration as before, since sulfuric acid is diprotic. Upon addition, there's absolutely no reaction. Not really hiding, but behind beaker number three is a more or less saturated solution of sodium chloride. This will introduce the chloride ions without adding any acid. And again, in short order, the reaction starts going. What's interesting is that as soon as I added a few crystals of a chloride salt to the beaker with sulfuric acid, the reaction proceeds just like normal. This is the reaction with the sulfuric acid and chloride salt after a few minutes. And there's one more thing I'd like to try. Here's another 100 milliliters of 0.5 molar copper sulfate solution. If you're keeping score, I used that up today too. Anyway, I'm going to add a generous scoop of aluminum chloride. This way there are no extra ions floating around, only the addition of Cl-. Once all the aluminum chloride had dissolved, in goes the aluminum foil. It took just a second to get going. And there you have it. It's working just fine. There are all sorts of tests that could be done to take this investigation further. Do iodide and bromide work as well as chloride? What about nitrate? As we saw in the sodium activity series video, a more reactive metal will precipitate copper hydroxide instead of copper metal. What about a less reactive metal like zinc? And if zinc reacts with copper ions in solution, Will it do so without chloride being present? One could say that such basic questions 
aren't important when there are so many advances in the field of chemistry. But if you don't understand the basics, how could you ever expect to understand the state of the art? Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Soon!